Some of his colleagues differ because not only are they not against wind farms, they have some of their own. <laughs> that ends general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Order. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Let's end the old Westminster way of doing things, which has caused misery for Scotland's most vulnerable. We have the opportunity to chart a different economic path, one that benefits the whole of society. Not my words, President Officer, but the words of Michelle Thompson in the SNP's General Election Manifesto. Words that ring somewhat hollow now that we know the Crown Office is investigating the economic path the SNP MP went down herself. Just eight months after her lawyer was struck off for his involvement in her property deals, Michelle Thompson was selected to be an SNP candidate for Edinburgh West. Can the First Minister tell Parliament if anybody in the SNP, whether it's Nicola Sturgeon herself, SNP politicians or SNP officials at any level, were aware of Michelle Thompson's allegations before they were printed in the Sunday Times? I recognise there is a lot of interest in this issue. But can I remind all members that questions to the First Minister should relate to matters which are within her general responsibility? This is not a main matter on which the First Minister is obliged to respond. First Minister. I'm happy to respond. Okay, so I dug deal. First Minister. I'm more than happy uh, to respond, Presiding Officer. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, the SNP did not have prior knowledge of any of these issues. Can I say though, as I also said yesterday, serious issues have been raised here and I acknowledge that. Serious issues which, if they were to be proven, uh, would be issues of significant concern. It is also important though to stress, presiding officer, that Michelle Thompson maintains all of her business dealings uh, were within the law and she strongly denies any wrongdoing. Now, this may be an unfashionable view, but politicians, just like anyone else in our society, are entitled to a presumption of innocence. And I would have thought a political party that has spent this week advocating a kinder politics would perhaps have been the first to acknowledge that fact. There is now a police investigation underway into these matters, and I think it is important that that investigation is allowed to proceed without anyone seeking to prejudge its outcome. Michelle Thompson has decided to step aside from the SNP while that investigation is undertaken. I think that was the right thing for her to have opted to do. I think it is now incumbent on the rest of us to allow that investigation to proceed uh, and to proceed to a conclusion. The First Minister is right, and I'm not prejudging anything, but I'm asking her... No, no. No, no. Order. No, no, no. We need to look at the facts here, presiding officer. The facts are undisputed. A tribunal issued a damning verdict. That is a fact. A lawyer was struck off. That is a fact. The Crown Office was made aware of concerns. That is a fact. Vulnerable families lost out. If the First Minister is saying that no one at any level in the SNP knew about the nature of Michelle Thompson's business dealings, does that mean that nobody asked her? First Minister. Look, Kezia Dugdale is right when she says that it is a fact there has been a solicitor's discipline tribunal. Uh, she's also right to say it is a fact that a solicitor has been struck off. Neither of those things prove the guilt of anything, of any other person. And I simply make the point I made earlier on. However uh, tempting it is for all of us in the hurly-burly of politics to seek to prejudge issues, politicians, like everyone else, are entitled to a presumption of innocence. Now, I've said yesterday, I've said again today, the SNP had no prior knowledge of these issues. Of course, as I've also already said, Michelle Thompson denies any wrongdoing. Therefore, presumably, uh, she would maintain that there was nothing for her to have brought to the attention of the SNP. Now, our vetting procedures as a party uh, are robust, but we keep them under review, as I would hope every political party does. 
But I would also uh, put forward, and I, again, I, I think this is something that I would expect all political parties to acknowledge, that while we make all reasonable checks and ask reasonable questions, by definition, it is not reasonable to expect that matters of which we have no knowledge can be investigated. Yes. Uh, but what is also ridiculous, I think, to suggest of any political party presiding officer, the SNP or anybody else, is that any party would knowingly allow a candidate to go forward for selection, knowing there were serious problems about the integrity of that individual candidate. So let me repeat that there is a police investigation into uh, aspects of these matters underway. Uh, I, as the leader of the SNP, uh, and indeed as First Minister, will always act in a way I think is appropriate, but I will be driven in doing so, presiding officer, by facts, not by insinuation. Presiding officer, I'm not asking the First Minister to comment on the specifics of a live investigation. No, no. Order. Because I accept that, of course, criminal matters are for the police. But this is also a moral matter, and I would expect her to comment on that. What we have here is vulnerable families losing out for the financial gain of others. Vulnerable people being taken advantage of as their homes are snapped up at knockdown prices. So can I ask the First Minister... Does she agree with me that profiteering from vulnerable families is just plain wrong? First Minister. Well, order. Kezia Dugdale, although she disagrees with me as she's entitled to do on a whole range of issues, I, I hope would accept that my commitment to social justice and my commitment to helping vulnerable people like hers is, is beyond any question. Uh, if there are matters that are proven uh, to have been done, that are proven to have been done uh, wrong, then these will be serious issues that the SNP uh, will respond to. But I repeat again, we are dealing here with an individual who denies wrongdoing, who denies any breach of the law and who denies uh, that she has acted improperly. Now, I don't have access, neither incidentally does Kezia Dugdale, uh, to all of the information and the circumstances that the police will be able to access. That is why it is important for all of us uh, to allow the police to do their job. There is a police investigation underway. I think it's appropriate that that investigation is thorough, it is robust and it comes to a conclusion. And the rest of us uh, should be prepared to allow it to do so. Senator, I just asked the First Minister whether she thought that profiteering from vulnerable people was right or wrong. And this is a First Minister that claims that nobody in the SNP knew anything about this. And I will take her word for that. I will take her word. But now she does know. She knows that an elected representative in her party acted in a way that is unacceptable. Order. And this is someone... This is someone that the SNP did know. Fiona Hislop, already in trouble herself, spoke of Mrs Thompson's knowledge of business and passion to make Scotland a better place. Angela Constance is on record celebrating Michelle Thompson's compassion. Alex Neil said Michelle Thompson demonstrated commitment to how business can be used to support social justice. And this is the First Minister who made her her shadow business secretary. The First Minister has spent two days running away from Michelle Thompson as fast as she can. But isn't it the case that for the last two years, Michelle Thompson has been right at the heart of everything the SNP stand for? First Minister. One. Order. Let us hear the First Minister. One fact that Kezia Dugdale has omitted from that long list of mudslinging there was this one, that today, following, following these issues coming to light, Michelle Thompson is currently not a member of the SNP because she took the decision, Order. she took the decision while these investigations are underway to relinquish the party whip and as a result of the SNP rules that means her party membership 
is also suspended. I think that was the right and responsible thing for her to have done in the circumstances. Now, I have no intention, presiding officer, on a serious matter, and a matter that I recognise is serious, to get into a party political uh, exchange over this. But I will simply point out that it has not always been the case uh, that where Labour politicians have been accused of serious offences, that they have found themselves outside of the party while those investigations have been undertaken. So I repeat what I said earlier on, uh, presiding officer. I have uh, very onerous responsibilities as First Minister and I have responsibilities as leader of the SNP. I will always seek to discharge those responsibilities to the very best of my ability, but I will discharge those responsibilities on the basis of the facts before me. I will do that in this case and I will do it in every other case. That is the responsible and appropriate way for me to proceed. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, let us try going through all of this again. We already know... Order. Order. We already know that the Crown Office and Police Scotland were asked whether they would investigate this case in July of last year. We know that the Law Society raised it with the Crown Office in December. We know that journalists have been investigating it all summer. And we know that the police were called in nearly three months ago. And yet the First Minister is asking us to believe that nobody in the SNP, the party of government, from the constituency in Edinburgh West right up to the chief executive and the leader herself, knew anything about this until they read it in the paper almost two weeks ago. Does the First Minister think this sounds believable? Or is it the case that somebody somewhere turned a blind eye? First Minister. Order. I, I, I do. Uh, I, I do think that reasonable people listening to the answers I'm giving today uh, will uh, opt to believe that that is the case. Uh, why? Because I would not stand here and say it was the case if it wasn't the case. Now, Ruth Davidson says that you know, we all knew that the Law Society was investigating, that the Crown Office was investigating, that journalists were investigating no. all summer. Did she know any of that before the Sunday Times published these stories? Because I certainly didn't know these things until they came to light in the media. So if Ruth Davidson uh, is saying that everybody knew this, then presumably she would have known, but unless she's saying so, uh, I'll take it that she didn't. The fact of the matter is we had no prior knowledge Order. of these issues. Uh, we now do know about the allegations that have been made, and I stress the word allegations. There is now, as is entirely appropriate, a police investigation into those allegations. Uh, I'm happy and keen to see that uh, investigation be thorough and robust, and I will take whatever action at the conclusion of that the facts determine is necessary and appropriate. And I think it would be uh, fitting for all politicians uh, to take exactly the same approach. Yeah, yeah. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister is in charge when it suits her, but when the wheel comes off, she is constantly surprised by what's going on. She's surprised by tea in the park. She's surprised by government loans to SNP donors, and now she's surprised by this. But what the First Minister can't have missed were the sort of business practices that Michelle Thompson was involved in and boasted about in public view on her own website. And since the First Minister says she's read the papers, she must also have read the responses, the responses from the vulnerable people who are hurt and who are angry at the way in which they've been treated in order to profit the First Minister's former business spokesperson. This morning, Michelle Thompson's solicitor said that she wants to come back into frontline politics as quickly as possible. Now, today, the First Minister has mentioned the police investigation a number of times. Let's put the police investigation to one side for a moment. On the basics... On... Order. Hello. On the basics of ethics and integrity alone, does this First Minister welcome Michelle Thompson back to her front bench? First Minister. 
You know, for the so-called party of law and order to stand up in a parliamentary chamber and say on extremely serious matters, let's just put the question of a police investigation to one side, frankly beggars belief. I, I, am, I am in no doubt whatsoever in my mind order. that if the allegations and again, I stress the word allegations, are proven to be correct, eh, then that will represent behaviour that I find completely unacceptable. But I am not going to judge the outcome eh, on the basis of somebody who maintains their innocence an investigation that has not yet concluded. It would be incredibly unfair and inappropriate for me to do that, and I put it to this chamber and indeed to the public, that it is unfair and unacceptable for any politician to ask me to do that. But when we have all of the facts, when the investigation is concluded, I will take whatever decisions and whatever actions I deem necessary. But, presiding officer, those decisions will be driven by facts, not by insinuation and the attempts of opposition parties to stir up uh, political trouble and difficulty. That's the way I'll continue to proceed, and I think it's the appropriate thing to do. Question three, Willa Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willa Rennie. Last week, the First Minister told me GPs were happy with her plans for primary care. But look at what the Chair of the Royal College of GPs said this week. The Scottish Government needs to act urgently. It stalled, sitting fallow. The government needs to stop prevaricating and deliver immediate action, not more promises for tomorrow. So GPs are far from happy. This morning, Shona Robinson addressed the GP conference. What new and immediate action did she commit to? First Minister. Well, I uh, can give Willie Rennie some more up-to-date information about the views of GPs, uh, because as, she, uh, as he rather says, uh, Shona Robinson has been uh, making announcements today. Here's what Dr Alan McDevitt, chair of the BMA Scottish GP Committee, has said today. Uh, the removal of the COAF system is a significant step towards our vision for the future of general practice in Scotland. This bold move by the Cabinet Secretary is part of the reinvigoration of general practice in Scotland. It will have a positive effect on practices by reducing workload and bureaucracy, allowing GPs to focus on the complex care needs of their patients. Uh, that's the views of uh, GPs, uh, or at least the GP representative of Shona Robinson's announcement this morning. I could also read out a lot of quotes uh, from from social media this morning of GPs uh, in England uh, listening to that announcement and wishing they could come to Scotland to practice instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Willa Rennie. She, she talks about the quaff, but that's going to be two years away. That's hardly a media action. Today, and this is what's happening today, NHS Fife told me they are having to step in to save methyl practice. Yesterday, we learned of pressures in Aberdeen for GPs at night time, and Dumfries and Galloway NHS issued a recruitment warning. The First Minister said she was doing everything she could, but 99% of GPs said it was not enough. The truth is, the Scottish Government have been caught napping. Ministers say everything is fine. Everyone else says it is not. It's like the police all over again. I am trying to shake the Government and the First Minister out of her denial. When will she open her eyes? When will she end the denial? First Minister. Well, you know, Willie Rennie says, I say everything is fine. A, I don't say that. That's why I was able last week to list a long list of initiatives backed by resources that Shona Robinson and the government were taking. But the uh, bulk of the answer I gave to his first question uh, were not actually my own words at all. They were the words of Dr Alan McDevitt, who is the chair of the BMA's Scottish GP Committee. So we are working closely and constructively with GPs to deal with recruitment challenges, to deal with the pressures that come from the changing demographics of our country, changing patterns of technology and how healthcare is delivered, to make sure that we have 
a system and a model of primary care that is fit for practice, not just now, but into the years that lie ahead. And we are determined that that is backed uh, by a modern fit for practice GP contract. I think that's exactly the action people would expect the government working with GPs to date. So we'll continue to do it. And as we do, I have no doubt that Willie Rennie will continue to cart from the sidelines. Question number four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government is making in implementing the so-called Clare's Law. First Minister. Well, I think it's right that people in relationships should have the opportunity to seek the facts about their partner's background if, for example, they have concerns that their partner has a history of violence. The disclosure scheme for domestic abuse in Scotland, otherwise known as Clare's Law, has proven successful in the pilot areas of Ayrshire and Aberdeen, and I was delighted to announce in July the decision to roll that scheme out across the country. Uh, the scheme, as of today, therefore, will be available across Scotland. That means that anyone who feels they may be at risk of domestic abuse will have the right to ask for information about their partner. I think this sends a strong and unequivocal message that abuse is unacceptable and that we are committed to action that can help to reduce the risk of further harm. Christina McKelvey. I thank the First Minister for that answer and that very, very welcome uh, rollout um, today. Would she agree with me and the many organisations who have campaigned for this that Police Scotland's disclosure scheme for domestic abuse is vital, absolutely vital, to defeat the scourge of domestic violence in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with that. I hope everybody would agree with that. We want to uh, stop domestic abuse in all of its forms and this scheme uh, enables us, gives us another very important tool uh, to help to do that. Put simply, presiding officer, this scheme does have uh, the ability to save lives. Uh, but it's not the only thing we need to do to combat domestic abuse. That's why uh, we're also taking forward a range of other measures to prevent and eradicate domestic abuse. In March, I announced another £20 million over the next three years to step up our work to tackle violence against women and girls. That money will be used to drive innovation and improvement within the justice system, tackle perpetrators of domestic abuse and increase public awareness. I think uh, the collection of initiatives that this government is taking, I hope backed by cross-party support, will help us in the years to come to make sure that we are not just taking uh, a stand against domestic abuse, we are reducing the impact of domestic abuse in our communities. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too welcome the rolling out of Clare's Law. However, I'm disappointed at the lack of progress made on the delivery of Equally Safe. The Strategic Board for Implementation was supposed to have reported six months ago, but it's yet to meet. And it will be sad that the first Parliament, led by a female First Minister, was to go down in history as the one that had done least to tackle violence against women. Can I ask the... Order. Can I ask the First Minister... Can I ask the First Minister if she will take the opportunity to make progress on the implementation of Equally Safe this afternoon by backing my amendments to the Human Trafficking Bill? First Minister. Well, I have to say I found uh, aspects of that question by Rhoda Grant deeply, deeply depressing because this is an issue on which, you know, I'm... I, I'm a politician. I'm as capable of any politician uh, in this chamber, perhaps more capable than some, of being party political on a variety of issues. But this is an issue we shouldn't be party political on, presiding officer. This is an issue. And given, given that I've just stood here and announced today uh, the start of the uh, complete rollout of a pioneering, innovative scheme uh, to help reduce domestic violence. Given that I've just talked again about the additional £20 million uh, pounds resources that I decided uh, to invest in measures to reduce domestic violence, to come up with a, a comment like that, I, I think, is, is not worthy of the member. But she does raise an important point about Equally Safe, and she will be aware uh, that we are making progress in uh, taking forward the commitments in Equally Safe. I'm happy to write to her uh, with a detail detailed uh, report. Uh, she will see uh, some reference to this in the programme for government that was published uh, just a few weeks ago. This is an issue where not just am I determined, I think everybody across this chamber is determined to see real progress. So for goodness sake, whatever else we may divide on, let's get together and see we're going to tackle and eradicate domestic abuse in this country. Malcolm Chisholm. 
Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, can I welcome the careers law and the other initiatives that the First Minister announced uh, in her first answer? But can I tell her at the cross-party group on men's violence against women last night, there was some discussion about the specific offence of domestic abuse, which was in the consultation paper. Can she tell us why there has been a delay in introducing such a law, and can she give a categorical guarantee that such a law uh, will be introduced in due course? First Minister. Well, I think anybody who has listened to my comments in this uh, will have a very strong sense of my commitment to doing this. There hasn't been a delay in introducing this. What we have done is consult on the general principle. We are now moving forward to consult on the specific wording of a new offence of domestic abuse. Now, the reason we're doing that is because there are differences of opinion, uh, as Malcolm Chisholm, given the sterling work he's done in this issue over a long number of years, uh, will know. And on something as important as this, uh, the view is that it is vital that we get it right. Uh, I believe a a uh, specific offence of domestic abuse will allow us to capture more aspects of domestic abuse than the current law enables us to do. So I am absolutely committed to doing this, but I'm committed to doing it properly so that it has the desired effect of helping the many women uh, who currently suffer abuse in forms that the current law is not well suited uh, to dealing with. Question number five, Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the findings in Eunice and Scotland's College Staff Survey report, Learning the Hard Way. First Minister. Well, the progress that we've made in recent years through college reform is largely due to the commitment and professionalism of college staff across Scotland. So I want to take the opportunity, presiding officer, to express my gratitude to all of our college staff for the role they play in the success uh, of our colleges. Our priority is to build on this, ensuring that staff continue to be well-led and well-supported. Clearly, it is very important to understand properly the views expressed uh, by staff generally and in particular through staff surveys like the one Ian Gray has uh, commented on. Uh, so the Education Secretary will discuss the survey findings at her next meeting uh, with Eunice in Scotland and uh, will commit to taking forward whatever uh, needs to be done in order to address the concerns expressed in that survey. Ian Gray. President officer, I don't think the findings of this survey are hard to understand. 90% of staff think colleges are underfunded, 64% think college services have declined, 77% do not expect them to improve in the next year, and 69% blame the Scottish Government. Rather than express our gratitude to our hard-working college staff, does the First Minister not think she should apologise? First Minister. Well, I will continue to take uh, the view and the approach that I think is right to work with our college staff to make sure that our colleges continue uh, to deliver excellent education for our young people. Um, as I've said previously in this chamber, when we look at resource budgets uh, in cash terms, this government is spending more uh, than Labour did uh, when it was in office. Uh, but we will continue to make sure that we give priority in our spending decisions uh, to education, given the importance we attach to it. And I would also uh, point out, as I've done many times before, in every one of the last three years, we have not just met, we have exceeded our target to maintain the number of full-time equivalent places. Uh, the number of full-time students under 25 has increased by 15%, full-time students over 25 up by 25%. The number of women studying full-time courses is up by 15%. Uh, and of course, we're also investing heavily in the college estate, more than £530 million in college estates uh, since 2007. So, you know, these are the commitments we will make to making sure that we have a quality college education sector. Uh, the staff who work in that sector are vital to that, so we will continue to listen to them, to respond to them, and to work with them to deliver for even further improvements. Roderick Campbell. Um, First Minister, it was reported in Audit Scotland's report on colleges, Scotland's Colleges 2015 earlier this year that the SFA had met students as part of its six-month post-merger evaluations to discuss issues such as changes to learning and teaching, enrolment and access to colleges, and feedback indicated there had been little adverse effect on students. Is the First Minister aware if that remains the position? First Minister. Uh, I am certainly aware of the Auditor General's report, which was published back in, in April. It is, uh, I think, the most current evidence-based 
assessment of the state of the sector and it draws on surveys and other feedback indicating uh, that our reforms have had no adverse impact on students, uh, which I would say is backed up by the evidence that shows that more full-time students are achieving recognised qualifications. The number of students achieving HNCs and HNDs has increased by over 20% since 2007. Uh, there's been a 34% increase in students progressing from college to university uh, with advanced standing since 2009-10. So, you know, the proof of the pudding in that respect is in the eating. We have a college sector now that is enabling more young people to get the qualifications they need, either to go further in education or to go successfully into the workplace, which is perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing at youth unemployment at the much lower levels now than it has been in the past. Question six, Mark Macdonald. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase business innovation. First Minister. Well, I was pleased to announce on Monday this week that a new innovation fund totalling uh, £78 million will be available to stimulate business innovation. Uh, the fund will comprise £31 million of European Regional Development Fund uh, money, which will be matched by £47 million of funding from Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the Scottish Funding Council. It will enable a range of key activities aimed at increasing the number and level of companies investing in innovation in order to stimulate greater business university collaboration. It will also supplement the work of our innovation centres with a particular aim to shorten uh, development cycles for SMEs creating new products and services. Mark Macdonald. I uh, thank the First Minister for that answer. Can she advise uh, how this will work alongside the progress being made on the can-do strategy? And does she agree that it's important that we don't just uh, see Scotland as an attractive place to do business, we also see it as an attractive place to start businesses as well? First Minister. Uh, absolutely. I want Scotland to be seen as a great place, the best in the UK, to do business, to set up businesses, to expand businesses uh, and to invest in businesses. Now, Mark Macdonald uh, raises a very important uh, component Order. of our strategy, uh, Scotland Can Do, uh, which is a title I love, uh, is our route map to becoming uh, a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation. I know Labour don't like the idea of Scotland Can Do, but I do like it a lot. Uh, since its launch in November 2013, Order. We've invested in entrepreneurial talent. We've expanded our range of business innovation support tools. Uh, we're also building a £124 million network of innovation centres that will allow industry to make best use of our world-class university research and expertise and will showcase Scotland's fantastic capacity for innovation through our planned network of innovation and investment hubs in Dublin, Brussels and London. In every sense, presiding officer, we are a government putting our confidence in Scotland, which is probably why Scotland is putting our confidence, its confidence in this government. Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. How much of the £78 million announced on Monday is new money? First Minister. As uh, Gavin Brown would have been aware if he'd listened to my answer, uh, the announcement that I made on Monday is a combination of uh, money from the European uh, Fund, uh, European Regional Development Fund, uh, and money from our enterprise agencies and from the Scottish Funding Council. It is additional money that will augment uh, the work that those agencies are continuing to do. And the estimate is that it will allow our enterprise agencies to work with an additional 1,000 companies to help and support them uh, become more innovative. The message we want to send out is if there are big ideas out there in our companies, we want to help those companies bring them to fruition. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.